Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host, meteorologist D.T. from weatherist.com, the colonel of confusion, the captain of catastrophe, the commander of chaos. It's uh, 11.30 p.m. on Saturday evening, and instead of going to sleep or drinking beer, I'm up making weather videos, but that's what I do. I would have done this a little earlier in the week, but I had some uh, pretty serious dental work done earlier, and I just got my... Uh, uh, recovery back here so I really hard to do this sort of a uh, video and uh, voiceover when you've got uh, impaired speaking abilities because of the dentist at any event we're back in the saddle here let's get right to it lots to talk about here uh, we'll talk about the uh, dry uh, late August and September 2014 talk about the next two weeks some snow in Siberia uh, the uh, PDO the Pacific Decade Oscillation in the North Pacific signal and what it means for the winter also, some talk about the El Nino and MEI winter values as well. So, lots to talk about. Now, this here is the last 30 days with regard to temperatures. As you can see, uh, temperatures have been a little on the warm side across the deep south. But for most of the Midwest, or the, up, the plains, the northeast, temperatures have been pretty close to a, a normal, actually. You know, in this whole area, you can see very close to normal. And even this yellow stuff is only 0 to 2 degrees. So, you know, a little warm here and quite warm in the West Coast. But outside of that, it's been um, a pretty uh, normal temperature-wise. Now, precipitation is very different, of course. Now, the Midwest, they've had pretty good rains in Iowa and Illinois, Wisconsin, Kansas, Nebraska to finish off the crop there. But look at the rainfall relative to normal in the Northeast. Very impressive in terms of uh, areas of below normal rainfall throughout all the Northeast and here. That's, um, I don't know, that's uh, 25 to 50 percent of normal rainfall. And uh, this has a look at it a little closer. We can see uh, this is for late August into September, just for the northeast. And notice the dark red there. This is uh, anywhere from actual precipitation. So you can see the dark red is uh, close to a, a tenth of an inch of rain tops. And the orange is about one inch of rain. So pretty dry, no doubt about that. And if we look at the precipitation relative to normal, we can see, look at most of Virginia, uh, in the 5 to 25 percent rain, as well as a good portions of central and western Maryland, central and eastern Pennsylvania, up into New York, New Jersey, New York City, southeast of New York, and much of New England. And this is a special graphic. Since it's only September 1st here from the Northeast Regional Climate Center, you can even see, look at some of these numbers of 5 to 25 percent. And this is even after the rain from a couple days ago. But this, of course, goes to the 22nd. The rain actually fell the 24th, so I should say this does not include the rain, obviously. So, But still very, very dry, as you can see, up and down the I-95 corridor. And then, of course, we do have another rain event coming up here. Uh, it may not make it as far north as the last one. This is the, um, I guess this is the uh, Canadian model from midday on Saturday, and it has the rain in North Carolina up to southeast Virginia pretty heavy over Bama and Georgia and, and the Carolinas, but not much further north. This is the Canadian, again, which has some moderate rain to central southern Virginia. A lot of heavy rain here over Georgia and Alabama, south uh, western portions of South Carolina, up to five, six inches of rain there. Which seems reasonable to me. The issue is how far north is the rain going to get? And that, the European is about looks like this. It's got the rain getting up towards maybe Charlottesville, southern Maryland, the southern Delaware, but that's about as far north as it goes. Now, longer term, we can see some signals of some changes here. We can see that the uh, on the left-hand side, we have the Arctic Oscillation plots of the various models. You can see it begins to head downwards here as we go towards October 9th. And the same sort of thing here, October 9th with the uh, NAO as well. And then uh, on the but, on, but it's not a big change. Uh, if you look on the West Coast here, we're not getting a strong signal for any change here. Uh, notice that uh, the uh, EPO is pretty neutral and then a little slightly negative tip this way. And the P&A is you know, oscillating back and forth, not a strong signal one way or the other. So we do have a negative NEO coming up and a negative uh, Arctic oscillation, but it's not a big deal. It's not going to be a big, huge cold blast, but seasonal cold. And we can see this here on the European ensembles. Notice we have here the uh, area of low pressure. This is after the cold front goes through on October 3rd, 4th. We have a little bit of a low right in here. There's a trough access. This may scoot along the coast. Does not, does, this does not, it's not going to do this off the coast. That's not going to happen if it does anything, like I said, east, northeast, off the coast. And then later on, as we go towards October 12th, you can see we're getting a couple cold fronts coming in here. The trough is beginning to amplify, and the pattern is turning seasonally cold by the time we get to mid-October. 
So, you know, that's, that's October, right? Let's take a look at some winter clues. And uh, we'll start out by taking a look at the North Pacific signal. Now, this comes from the uh, meteorologist Al Joseph, who's a, uh, a grad student who works for the Midwest Regional Climate Center, who's a fabulous forecaster in his own right. And he looked at the uh, in March, April, May, June, July, August, as you can see right up in here, um, the uh, a North Pacific signal. So he's looked here at sea surface uh, uh, temperatures between in the North Pacific, this whole area, where it's been super warm. And what does that mean? And we look for analogs, the top 10 w winters um, or seasons, the top 10 seasons right in here, and uh, what those winters look like. So look for the top 10 of this sort of analog with this amazing amount of warm water in here. And what we end up getting is uh, very st strong anomalies to some very impressive looking winters. 1957, 1962, 1957, last winter as well. So very impressive. So his analog is 13.428, which is just off the charts. And like I said, that's a very strong signal for this sort of pattern. And what this produces is, if you look at all the 10 of these analogs, okay? Now follow this. All 10 of these analogs, okay? Right in here. What sort of pattern does that produce? Well, we have a very strong negative NAO, and we have a big trough like this, running like, like this, or like this. So a, a lot of extremely cold temperatures in the Midwest and the central Canada pushing southward. And uh, the trough is uh, over the Midwest, it looks like, which is a pretty good snowstorm track for the East Coast. Because what happens is, in this sort of pattern, when your trough is on the uh, east, well, over the plains like this, the low pressure areas come down and they turn negative here and they come off the coast. So this could be a very strong uh, snowstorm pattern for the East Coast. And what he did is he broke this down. It took all those years and he broke it down into several different categories. Now, some of these were La Nina years. Like, for instance, 2005, 2006, that was a La Nina, see? right here, La Nina. Now, we don't have a La Nina. We have El Nino, so we can discount that. That's gone. 67, 68, 49, 50, get rid of it. Okay, this can get rid of this as well. This is an actual neutral in here, so we can kind of include that maybe. But, but if you look at the El Ninos and the North Pacific signal, 58, 59, 57, 58, 63, 64, these are some cold, cold winters in here. And uh, if we look at no El Ninos, if, let's say the El Nino falls apart, we just have the North Pacific signal. We have a 5960, and last year, 2013, 2014. So, as you can see, this is a cold map, this is a cold map, this is a cold map, this is cold, this is cold. Only way this does not turn out to be cold is if we get to a La Nina, which is not going to happen. So, uh, that's a very strong indication right there. And if we look at the uh, latest uh, uh, El Nino uh, uh, model plots here from the IRI Institute, we can see a general uh, weak uh, conditions, weak to uh, barely moderate as we go into the uh, December, January, February periods. Most of the data keeps it under one degree Celsius, uh, which seems very reasonable to me. Now, if we look at those MEI numbers, so we now remember that's how we actually measure the El Nino. It's uh, not just the water temperatures, but the overall uh, a much deeper, uh, a more comprehensive value, which is called the MEI, multi index. And if we look at the numbers here, you can see that the number is right now is uh, in, uh, I guess this is June, uh, point, uh, yeah, 0 0.932, then 0 0.87, then 0 0.816, and currently 0 0.858. So what that means is that it looks like as we go into the winter months, we're anticipating these values right in here continuing. So we think, therefore, that the MEI is going to stay around a 1, a near close, plus 1, not any warmer than that. So if we look at all the past data and we look at MEI values, approximately 0.9 during the autumn and winter, that gives us three analogs in particular, 1977, 78, 2002, 2003, 2009, 2010. All three of those were pretty impressive winters on the East Coast. And if we look at the overall pattern temperatures of those three analogs, well, it's extremely cold, as you can see up in here. Look, there's a very impressive cold right in this area in here, as you can see. And then over here, if we look at the overall pattern, we have blocking up in here, a big area of negative anomalies right here, which produces big East Coast snowstorms. And the anomaly is not over here, it's right in here, and that's very positive for East Coast snowstorms. So that's impressive looking as well. And if we look at the large hemispheric pattern of those years, 77, 2002, 2009, 79, 69, so on and so forth, all those with an analog between plus 9 and 
1.0. We end up getting, look at the strong signal for severe blocking here um, over the east, over Greenland. That's a very impressive signal here. And there's our negative anomaly here. This is a snowstorm looking winter pattern if this ends up working out being correct. But that's assuming, of course, that the MEI stays at that value. The MEI might go higher than that, and it could change things significantly. So we, have to, we can't just automatically assume that. Now, if we look at the Japanese model, uh, this is one from September. It warmed up the East Coast a little bit. I know some people looked at it. They said, oh, my God, we're warming. It's not. This is a very minor adjustment. It's not a big deal. A lot of cold here uh, over the upper plains in the Midwest and southern Canada, which kind of matches uh, you know, the uh, cold back in the East Maps we talked about back in here. So we can see the cold in here and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, that kind of matches it. And if we look at the precipitation, well, this is actually quite good. Again, for those who want East Coast storms, you can see it's quite above precipitation up and down the East Coast here. So that's not a bad signal at all. Now, keep in mind, of course, that the Japanese model last year did not do a great job. So, again, we're still way out here, folks. If we look at the overall upper air patterns on the Japanese climate model, we're not looking at the operational J J JMA. That's a piece of crap. But the climate model is pretty good. And what we see here is we can see very pronounced strong ridge on the west coast and a deep trough here on the east coast. You can see that. And, again, the anomaly is here. And notice that the spread or the other variants or possibilities is to have a strong negative anomaly on the east coast you can see i right off the east coast from virginia up towards boston and up towards maine so that's again a strong signal that storms when they come off through the mid midwest off the east coast might become significant winter storms again assuming this is correct and of course this is the japanese model from last year from september 2013 for the winter and as you can see it didn't show the severe cold at all so you have to be careful with these climate models folks now, if we look at the snow cover, this is the latest here from the Rutgers folks. You can see above normal snow cover. That's what the blue means here in Siberia. Northern Siberia is starting out early, so that's an interesting signal. Um, and if we look at the latest, this is as of uh, September 24th. That black line is 60 degrees north latitude, okay? So that's, what, that's the issue. Remember, when we're looking at measuring the SAI, the Snow Advance Index, okay, it's the rate of snow change between 60 down to 25 north. That's the issue in October. So having big snow up in here in early, late September, early October is good. We don't want the snow coming south too early. Okay? And, again, the reason why that happens is that when the snow advances south uh, later in October, you get a much stronger uh, negative Arctic Oscillation signal. So, and then this is uh, September 27th. You can see increasing snow all north of the black line. And then finally, as we go into October, early October, a lot of snow developing very quickly in central and northern Siberia. But again, north of the 60 degrees line. You see that 60 degree line? That's the important point. All the snow here is staying north of this line. It's all up in here, and that's fine. And later on, as we go into October, we want the snow to come southward, but not right away. So that's working out quite nicely. Again. Whole, assuming the trend holds. And if you look at the upper air patterns, we can see what's going on in Russia. Deep persistent trough here. Uh, today, this is the upper air map. And then we have a big storm over uh, off of uh, the Vladivostok coast and near Cham Kamchatka, which is, drops all the heavy snow in eastern Siberia. And then finally, uh, day 10, we can see the troughs, more energy coming in here. A big, broad trough covering much of Siberia, producing more snow and below normal temperatures. So Siberia appears to be off to a good start as well. So we have a lot of different signals here which indicate a potentially significant winter coming up. Uh, I'm not completely convinced yet. I still need to see a few things. But so far, it's looking pretty good. So far. We still have a ways to go yet, folks. We have to get through October. We have to get into the first portion of November. And then we'll have a much better idea. But so far, if you like winter storms and cold and snow, the trend is your friend. This is meteorologist DT from weatherist.com. I'll talk to you soon.